welcome to Dean College's latest theatrical event, Mono a Mono. Um, there are four monologues, nine players, and a roll of the dice. Sit back and enjoy. I'm going to send you off to Tess Burnham, our host. Take it away, Tess. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for Mono a Mono tonight. My name is Tess Burnham, and I am one of the producers on this incredible project. We have some amazing monologues tonight. So we are going to start with none other than senior class member Cameron Ward. Let's give him a hand. All right. As Cam makes his way up to the stage, it is time to spin the dice to see what his fate is. All right, for Cam's classical comedy monologue, he will be doing The Miser by Moliere. Take it away, Cam. Thank you, Tess. I will tell you frankly that you are the laughing stock of everybody, that they taunt us everywhere by a thousand jokes on your account, and that no, nothing delights people more than to make sport of you and to tell stories without end about your stinginess. One says that you have special almanacs printed where you double the ember days in vigils so that you may profit by the fasts to which you bind all your house. Another, that you always have a ready-made quarrel for your servants at Christmas time or when they leave you so that you may give them nothing. One tells a story how not long since you prosecuted a neighbor's cat because it had eaten up the remainder of a leg of mutton. Another says that one night you were caught stealing your horse's oats and that your coachman gave you in the dark. <laughs> A good sound drubbing, of which you said nothing! <laughs> oh, in short, what is the use of going on? We can go nowhere, but we are sure to hear you pulled to pieces. You are the butt and jest and byword of everybody! And never does anyone mention you, but under the names of miser, stingy, mean fellow, oh, and usurer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cam. That was amazing. Our next contestant standing up to the plate is our first virtual contestant, Patrick McKinney of the freshman class. All right, Patrick, let's spin the dice to see what it lands on. All right, for Patrick's first monologue, he will be doing Alan's monologue from Equus. Take it away, Patrick. It was sexy. That's what you wanted to know, isn't it? All right, it was. I'm talking about the beach, a time when I was a kid, what I told you about. Was, um, I was pushed forward on the horse. There was sweat on my legs from his neck. The, the fellow held me tight and let me turn the horse any way that I wanted. All that power going any way you wanted. And his sides were all warm and the, and the smell. And suddenly I was on the ground. Her dad pulled me. I could have bashed him. But that's something else. 
Um, when the horse first appeared, I looked up into its mouth. It was huge. There was, there was this chain in it. The fellow pulled it tight and cream dripped out of it. I said, does it hurt? And he said, the horse said, desperately. It was always the same after that. Every time I heard one clop by, I had to run to see it. They sort of pulled me. I, I couldn't take my eyes off of them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. What an incredible monologue. Our next contestant standing up to the plate on the main stage is none other than Sarah Mello of the junior class. All right, Sarah, let's spin that dice. Sarah's contemporary dramatic monologue will be from Dog Sees God by Bert V. Royal. Take it away, Sarah. Thank you. Wait! I was pregnant. Don't worry, it wasn't yours. I had just gotten an abortion the day before and the next day in biology, we were ironically learning about reproduction. I'm sitting there in Miss Rainey's class, listening to her talk about fallopian tubes, eggs, the uterus, blah, blah, fucking blah, and I'm feeling sick to my stomach already, trying to don't out on anything I can. So I start reading a note over Miss Puritanical Princess's shoulder. And she's telling her friend how happy she is, that she's a virgin, and she's going to stay that way till marriage, and how repulsed she is by all the whores at her school. <laughs> Without even thinking about it, I reach into my pocket for my cute little red Vic lighter, and I light her cute little red hair on fire. Every day in therapy, they ask me if I'm sorry yet, but, but I just can't be. Bitches like that make me sick. Hell, they've made me sick. I am officially sick, psychotic, unrepentant, and unremorseful. I've been branded as a sociopath, and I have no choice but to believe it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Such honest work. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Next up is one of our virtual contestants, one and only Nick Maloof from the junior class. All right, Nick, you know the drill. Let's spin that dice. <laughs> All right, your contemporary comedic monologue is Father Donnelly from the Myria of Bet and Boo, written by Christopher Durang. You're all set, Nick, take it away. Thank you, Tess. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good evening, young Marys. Aha! The theme of marriage in the Catholic Church, and in this retreat, is based around the story of Christ. <laughs> Jesus Christ was not expecting a phone call, so if you give me one minute, I'll answer that and come right back. So, what I was saying, Jesus Christ blessed the young wedding couple at King. Hello. Jesus Christ blessed the young wedding couple at Cana. He did. Now, when they ran out of expensive wine, 
that's where he performed his first miracle. Hey, oh, uh, but back to the couple. What the husband does to make the wife happy is important. Now, there's a lot of things that you know young couples have to get used to in a marriage. You know, the husband has to get used to a wife in his bathroom, and the wife has to get used to a husband in her boudoir. You know, but what if the wife can't cook well enough? Now, how many marriages have floundered on the rocks over ill-cooked bacon? <laughs> you know, I used to do an impersonation of bacon frying in a saucepan. Would anyone like to see? Oh no, don't make me do it. Okay, fine, I'll do it. All right, all right, all right. So first I start like this, you know, I get into position. And then, no, I can't do it, I can't do it. But I do do coffee percolating. Yeah, yep, yep, all right. So you pour the water in the back, you know, you pop the cake up in. No, I can't do it. I can't do it. It's not about me. I can't. Anyways, things like coffee and bacon are important in a marriage. You know, they represent what the wife does to make the husband happy or fat. Oh, I gotcha. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic job, Nick. Congratulations. So, so, so good. Uh, so next up, um, making her way to the stage, we have Miss Tess Burnham. And she is going to be performing, we don't know, let's roll the dice to find out. Tess's first monologue of the evening, Steph's monologue of Reasons to be Pretty by Neil Laboot. Take it away, Tess. He hurt me. <laughs> he really did. Look, I, I can take a lot anyways. But it's my face. I don't know, it just, it totally sucks when you find out he's not into your face. Why that is, I don't know. I'm not saying this with profound insight or anything, but any woman I know, my age or, oh God, or younger would be totally upset if she heard what I did. That her boyfriend thinks her face is just okay. You can't swallow that down and find a way to come up smiling. You could try, but it just doesn't work. Oh my, oh, could you imagine what he's, when he's talking about my body and the way we, uh, it's too much, it is. I can't even think about it without wanting to vomit. And I always thought my face, it was one of my better parts. And he's out there talking about me like, like I'm some old Buick in the backyard, you know, that he keeps wanting to fix, but he just can't get to it. And the worst part of it all, he meant it as a compliment. He meant it as a compliment. No, screw that. I'm sick of this. I know me as a person, and I don't got that much going for me. But whatever I've got, I like it. And only I can protect them. Wouldn't you? Thank you. Congratulations, Tess. Great job, as always. We are going to throw it on to our next contestant, Colleen Tenney. Miss Colleen, let's roll the dice and see what you're playing for tonight. All right, first round, we have a comedic contemporary monologue, Bench Seat by Neil Laboot. All yours, babe. Thank you. Thank you. 
I mean, you have to understand, this guy before you, I showed you his photo that one time, remember? He really hurt me. And I think I'm so hypersensitive to another incident like that one that I'm still jumpy. I am, like two years later. For months after I wanted to hurt him, I really did. I'd follow him to class and send him all this stuff in the mail, like blow dead field mice and crap. <laughs> yeah, I was so out of it. Yeah, like this one time I screamed at this chick he took to a softball game. I mean, like in her face. <laughs> you should have seen her. Man, it was priceless. You know, he even called the cops once, but I was like, so what? Screw him. I mean, it seemed all totally random and they couldn't do a thing about it. The police. He had sent me packing, which is wrong. That's bad. That's a bad thing to do to someone who loves you. So you see, that's what I was thinking about on the way up here and sorry if I was all weird. Thank you. Amazing job, Colleen. Thank you so much. That was incredible. All right, everybody, to close out our first round of Mono We Mono, we have a very <laughs> special guest who could it be other than our producer, Professor Jim Beauregard. <laughs> All right, Jim, let's spin that dice. <laughs> All right, Jim's classical drama monologue is Shylock's monologue from The Merchant of Venice, written by William Shakespeare. Whenever you're ready, Jim. Senor Antonio, many a time and off at the Rialto, you rated me about my monies and their usances. Still, I bore it with a patient shrug, for sufferance is the badge of all our tribe. You called me misbeliever, cutthroat dog. You spat upon my Jewish gabardine and all for the use of that which is mine own. Well then, it now appears you need my help. Go to then, you come to me and you say, Shylock, we would have monies. You say so. You who did void your room on my bed and did put me as you would a strange cur over your threshold. Monies is your suit. What should I say to you? Should I not say half a dog monies? <laughs> Is it, is it possible a courier can lend 3,000 ducats? Oh no, or should I bend low in a bondsman's key with bated breath and whispering humbleness say this? Fair sir, you spat on me on Wednesday last. You spurned me such a day. Another day you called me dog and for these courtesies, I'll lend you thus much monies. <laughs> Why look how you storm. I would be friends with you, have your love. Forget the shame you have stained me with. Take no dose of uses for my monies, and you'll not hear me? This kindness will I show. Go with me to a notary. Seal me there your single bond, and in a merry sport, if you repay me not on such a day and such a place, such sum or sums that are expressed in the condition, let the forfeit be nominated for an equal pound of your fair flesh to be cut off and taken from whichever part of your body it pleaseth me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. All right, everybody. We are going into our second round of monologues. So everybody you just saw is gonna go again for another spin of dice for their fate. Going up first on our lineup, Coming back to the stage, please welcome Cameron Ward. All right, we are going to spin the dice to see which monologue Cam will be doing for us.
All right. Heading over to contemporary drama, Cam will be performing a monologue from Red by John Logan. Whenever you're ready, Cam. Thanks, Tess. Bores you? Bores you? Christ almighty, try and working for you for a living. The talking, 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 Jesus Christ, won't he ever shut up? Titanic self-absorption of the man! You stand there trying to look so deep when you're nothing but a solipsistic bully with your grandiose self-importance and lectures and arias and let's look at the fucking canvas for another few weeks. Let's not fucking paint. Let's just look! Ah, oh, and the pretension. Jesus Christ, the pretension. I can't imagine any other painter in the history of art ever tried so hard to be significant. You say you spend your life in search of real human beings, people who can look at your pictures with compassion. In your heart, you no longer believe those people exist. So you lose faith, so you lose hope. So black swallows red. My friend, I don't think you'd recognize a real human being if you were standing right in front of you. Never mind. Thank you. Amazing, Kim Ward. Thank you so, so much for your monologue. Next up, we have Patrick McKinney of the freshman class coming back for a second round. Time to spin the dice. For his comedic contemporary monologue, Patrick will be doing Algernon's monologue from the importance of being earnest. Take it away, Patrick. Thank you. Oh, I haven't the smallest intention of dining with Aunt Augusta. To begin with, I dine there on Monday, and once a week is quite enough to dine with one's own relations. In the second place, whenever I do dine there, I am treated as a member of the family, and sent down with either no women at all, or two. Oh, in the third place, I know perfectly well whom she'll place me next to tonight. Oh, she'll place me next to Mary Farquhar, who always flirts with her own husband across the dinner table. It's not very pleasant. Indeed, it's not even decent. And that sort of thing is enormously on the increase. The amount of women in London who flirt with their own husbands is perfectly scandalous. It looks so bad. It's simply washing one's clean linen in public. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. Next up, we have none other than Sarah Mello of the junior class coming back for her second round of monologue. Alrighty, Sarah, it is time to spin that dice. For her classic dramatic monologue, Sarah will be doing Helena's monologue from All's Well That Ends Well by William Shakespeare. Whenever you're ready, Sarah. Thank you. Till I have no wife, I have nothing in France. Nothing in France until he has no wife. Oh, thou shalt have none, Brazilian, none in France. Then hast thou all again. Poor Lord, is it I that chase thee from thy country and expose those tender limbs of thine to the event of the nuns sparing war? And is it I that drive thee from thy sport of court, whether thou wast shot at with fair eyes, to be the mark of smoky muskets? 
Oh, you leaden messengers that ride upon the violent speed of fire, fly with false aim, move the still peering air that sings with piercing, do not touch my lord. Whoever shoots at him, I set him there. Whoever charges on his forward breast, I am the caitiff that holds him to it, and though I kill him not, I am the cause his death was so affected. Better twere I met the raven lion when he roared with sharp constraint of hunger. Better twere that all the miseries which nature owes were mine at once, no! Come now, home resilient. And honor but of danger wins a scar as oft it loses all. I will be gone. My being here it is that holds thee hence. Shall I stay here to do it? No. No. Although the air of paradise did fan the house and angels office all, I will be gone. That pitiful rumor may report my flight to consolate thine ear. Come night and day, for with the dark, poor thief, I'll steal away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Our next contestant is none other than Nick Maloof once again. It is time to spin the dice and see what it lands on. For his contemporary dramatic monologue, which is a personal favorite of mine, he will be doing Arnold's monologue from Torch Song Trilogy, written by Harvard Feinstein. Take it away. Thanks, Tess. <laughs> no. You're right, Ma. How dare I? You know, I, I, I couldn't possibly know how it feels to pack someone's clothes in plastic bags and watch the garbage pickers carry them away. Or what it feels like to forget and set his place at the table. Or how about the food that rots in the refrigerator because you forget how to shop for one? Right, Ma? How dare I? Listen, Ma. You had it easy. Yeah, <laughs> you have 35 years to remember him. I have five. You had your children and your friends to comfort you. I had me. My friends didn't want to hear about it. You know, they, they, they said, what are you griping about? Huh, at least you had a lover. Because everybody knows that queers don't feel nothing. How dare I say I loved him? You had it easy, Ma. You, you lost your husband in a nice, clean hospital. I lost mine out there. They killed him out there on the street. 23 years old, lying dead on the street, killed by a bunch of kids with baseball bats. Children. Children taught by people like you. Because everybody knows that queers don't matter. Queers don't love. And those that do deserve what they get. You know, whatever happened to good old American momism and apple pie? Thank you. We did. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, we are now going to turn it over to uh, our host herself, uh, Ms. Tess Burnham. Let's go ahead and roll that dice, see what's up. For Tess's 
second and final monologue, we have a classic comedic, and that is going to be Puck from A Midsummer Night's Dream by William Shakespeare. Take it away, Tess. My mistress with a monster is in love! <laughs> oh, dear to her clothes and consecrated bower, while she was in her dull and sleeping hour, a crew of patches, rude mechanicals, that work for bread upon Athenian stalls, were met together to rehearse the play, intended for great Theseus's nuptial day. The shallowest thick skin of that barren sort, who Pyramus presented in their sport, forsook his scene and entered in a break. When I did him at this advantage take an ass's knoll I presented on his head. <laughs> Anon, his this be must be answered. And forth, my mimic comes. <laughs> So, at his sight, away his fellows fly. Their sense, thus weak, mixed with their fears, thus strong, made senseless things begin to do them wrong. I led them on this distracted fear, <laughs> and let sweet Pyramus translate it. Over there. And in that moment, <gasps> And so it came to pass, to talk your way to straightway, loved an ass. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic job. Fantastic job, Tess. What an incredible performance that was. Next up, we have Miss Colleen Penny. She is going to be performing. We don't know. Let's spin that dice to find out. All right, we have, let's see here, for Colleen, we have Contemporary Dramatic. That's going to be George's monologue from Spike Heels by Teresa Rebeck. Take it away. Thanks. You think I don't know how to behave in public or something? Jesus, I was a waitress for seven years. The customers fucking loved me. You think I talk like this in front of strangers? You Think I don't have a brain in my head or something? That is so fucking condescending. Anytime I lose my temper, I'm crazy. Is that it? You don't know why I threw the pencil. You just assume you make these assumptions. Well, fuck you, Andrew. I mean, fuck you. You don't even know. You've never seen me out of that office. I mean, like, am I incapable of acting like somebody I'm not? For four months, I've been scared to death, but I do it. You know, I, I take the messages, I call the court, I write his damn letters, I watch my mouth, I dress like this, whatever this is. I am gracious. I am right. I am promising. I am being this other person for them because I do want this job, but there is a point to which I will not be fucked with. So you finally push me beyond that point and I throw a pencil and now you're going to tell me that that's my problem? What, you guys think you hold the cards or something? You think you have the last word on reality? You do, you do think that anything you do to me is okay and anything I do is fucked because I'm not using the right words. I'm like throwing pencils and saying, fuck you. I'm speaking another language. That's my problem. And the thing is, I am America. You know, you guys are not America. You think you are. Jesus Christ, you think you run the whole fucking world. I mean, who made up these rules, Andrew? Who do you think's buying it? 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Colleen. What a great job. Thank you for the monologue. All right, and our final contestant of the night, who you all know, the lovely mystery guest, Professor Jim Beauregard. It is time. It is time to spin the dice one last time for the night. Closing out tonight's monologue fiasco, Jim will, will be doing Professor Stoller's monologue from Public Speech, Private Thought, written by Craig William Handel. Take it away, Jim. Historical junk. Because uh, you want to talk about contemporary stuff, because you're really interested in, in discussing the issues of the day. <laughs> Mr. Lee, all history is contemporary we are the sum of everything that has gone before us. And when you refuse to embrace all of this historical junk, you write off thousands of years of human endeavor and cultural evolution. And that's what I see with your test scores, cultural de-evolution. I see a self-absorbed, shallow, selfish generation consumed with materialism and instant gratification. This generation, your, generation, so-called culture, the one that you have created and have consumed with your consumption is completely devoid of human dignity. You, you have been blessed with the most powerful informational conduit conceived by the mind of man. And what have you done with it? Turned it into a profit-making purveyor of pornography and celebrity gossip? A, a cyberspace shopping mall that sells human degradation and misinformation. Instead of seizing control of it and using it for good, you have surrendered to it. And you let it take control. Well, you deserve to be manipulated. Your attention span has been defined by jump cuts and video games and the proliferation of remote control devices. Well, guess what? You can't change this channel with a flick of the remote. The only way you can get out of this class is by dropping. And that's what I'm here to offer. And the truth is, that's what you've always wanted an easy way out. So get out. Go. Now. Thank you. All right, and with that, the first ever Dean College School of the Arts Mono e Mono is a wrapped up. Thank you so much. So much for everybody who joined us today in person, virtually, or if you were watching from home. Thank you so much. Our next show is in two weeks. So if that is something you are interested in, please email us and we would be happy to have you join us. Jim, any final words? Thank you all for joining. Keep creating. Mano a mano. Work your craft. Senior projects. Let's go. We'll keep creating theater. Thank you all. Have a great weekend. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you in two weeks. Bye.